Today we have with us Mr. Funsho Doherty, former CEO of Power Pensions as well as ARM Pensions, and the Lagos State's gubernatorial candidate for the ADC at the last election. We will be talking about the latest on his open letter, which exposed the inefficient spending on the part of the Lagos State government and his response since then. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. It's been more than a week since your open letter that exposed what many people would say the inefficient spending of the Lagos State government. Um, and I know that the, I mean, the governor has since re responded to that open letter. And then you have done a follow up letter as well, and just addressing some of um, the claims made um, in the governor's response. So, can you tell us a bit about what, your, what that letter, the latest one you've just written, what it's about, and exactly you take the points you raised in this uh, latest letter? This latest response was a response, actually, to government's response. Government had responded through the uh, public procurement agency uh, on the issues that we had written. Yeah. And this is a further response in reaction to uh, those comments that government made. Um, and um, for some of them, we maintained the previous comments that we made because we don't believe that the response that was given addresses the issue. Uh, for some of them, we accepted government's explanation because we, we had to take their word for it. And uh, a number of them suggested policy um, issues, which uh, we then gave specific recommendations as to why we thought those policy actions could have been done differently. So it's a range of different things. I'm not sure I want to go through them individually, but they're out there on the on the um, on on our tweets, so you can see them in detail. We actually responded to every single um, issue uh, in follow up, so that it's not as if we made a, a an initial comment and 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 that was it. We we did follow up. On each of the comments, yeah. But can you, can you speak specifically about the uh, follow-ups that you did to the ones you said that um, you know you make policy suggestions? There are a few of them. Um, so, for example, there was uh, there was one about the Imota rice mill, uh, where the as you know um, that mill has been completed. Uh, it is being managed under a technical and management services agreement by WACOT. And originally it was supposed to have been run on a PPP basis, which means that there's an operator who would operate it commercially on a PPP basis with government. Uh, what government has indicated now is that uh, they are actually having WACOT operate it. They, government, are retaining the risks and the rewards of running the mill and they're just paying WACOT a fee for their services. Um, and as a policy um, direction, we think that you know, there, there may be a flaw in that, in the sense that, remember that WACOT is itself a commercial operator in this market. They're a big, um, they compete aggressively with their own brands, well-known brands in the market, and um, they have their own input supply chain. So they are in a conflicted position when you give them this kind of uh, technical and management services agreement. Um, so, so, so we thought that that, that needs to be looked at um, as, if, as an immediate measure. You have to have very clear and specific um, you know, benchmarks and performance uh, measurement criteria, etc. But I'm not sure that it's a sustainable uh, or wise but measure. Kind of PPP arrangement such that, um, I mean, you know the inefficiency <coughs> of government running business. So it's yeah. usually better to get the private sector to run the business so that you're more efficient and all of that. So I thought it was a PPP arrangement with WACOT and wasn't supposed to last forever. A PPP arrangement is fine, Yeah. right? But you don't go into a PPP arrangement where there's a, an inherent conflict. In other words, you don't give your competitor your business to run when they're in the same business, the business as you are. As you are. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to do a PPP with an independent entity and where there's an alignment of incentives, right? But I'm saying that there is a potential conflict here. This is just one. There's another one which, again, is a policy uh, kind of issue, which has to do with government's operation of retail petrol stations, yeah. fuel stations. And uh, we don't think this is a good use of government's resources uh, or attention, uh, and, and we said so. We don't think government 
ultimately will uh, be efficient in the running of that business. And it's competing with the private sector. And there's so many things that government ought to be doing, which require its resources, which require its time, yeah. um, which it should instead be focused mm -hmm. on. And being so, a competitor against it. Yeah, other. yeah. So, so these, are, these are a couple. Uh, there are several others. So let's talk about the controversy around the amount allocated for the blue line. The operations and maintenance service of that blue line. The original plan was that when the construction is completed, there would be a private operator that would operate the rail service uh, and then maintain it uh, under a PPP arrangement. Uh, government seems to have moved away from that. And the contract that we sort of raised the question about was for the purchase of operations and maintenance equipment for the blue line, which government was now undertaking at a cost of about 40 billion. And our question was, are you no longer doing this PPP? If not, who is going to be doing the operations and who's going to run the rail service? Is it Lamata? Does Lamata have the capacity? And government's response was that, well, we're going to have the contractor that built the rail operate it for some time and then train Lamata and so on. And our response in follow-up is, well, is this what they do? Um, you, you don't just, uh, I mean, the government needs to be satisfied that, uh, that the contractor that built the line is also competent and able to deliver the rail service and to train Lamata and so on. Uh, and that should not be assumed. Um, the second point that was raised has to do with the contract for the phase two, which has been awarded about 220 billion. Yeah. And what we've said is that, look, phase one kicked off 2008, supposed to be completed in about four years. We're just completing it now in 2023, almost 15 years later, as we are awarding the second phase to the same contractor, what safeguards do we have in place so to ensure that we're not going to be here in 2020, 2040 or 2050, yeah. uh, concluding phase two? There are a number of other things that we raise with respect to the power arrangement for, um, for the blue line, which also was supposed to be on a PPP, but government seems to be taking a different route now and essentially building the facility and then concessioning later. And we raised some questions around the contracting process for that. And these are all huge, huge contracts. Um, so in any event, there's a whole range of things which people can, but, but can take a look at. But do you think the delay that we saw with the um, first phase of the blue line is down to the contractors or to the legal state government? No, it's, I, I, you know, obviously it's legal state that can say what led to all the various, my suspicion is that there's probably a bit of blame on both sides if you have to allocate, but maybe more on the Lagos state side, right? But the, the greater point is that when you conceive of plan and manage projects like this, um, you know, if you invest the right resources up front and do the right things in terms of conceiving, conceptualizing, planning, organizing, um, you don't end up with this kind of outcomes because part of what you do is thinking about how you complete within a defined time frame. So when you say you want to do something in four or five years, beyond the operational capacity to do that and the technical competence of the people who are going to do it, financing is an integral part of that. So you need to know that you have a financing arrangement, X, Y, and Z components in place so that when you say you are completing it in four years, you have a path to completing it in four years, operationally and financially. And, um, and you dimension the risks and you plan for them and so on. This is how project management is done. We're not the first to deliver a rail service. It's not a humongous project. It's, it's, it's only about 28 kilometers. So, so quite frankly, uh, I think with focus, with the right intentions, uh, and with better planning, we could have done a lot better. True, true, awesome. So l let's talk about the billion uh, that was projected for new cars. Uh, I know the legal state government has said that it's, in fact, that amount, <laughs> that it's in reflection of the harsh economic realities. How, how do you respond to that? I think that we raised, and I mean, uh, uh, I mean, we raised a couple. One had to do with um, the purchase of a bulletproof vehicle, 450 million. Um, and we raised the question as to whether this was, you know, appropriate at this time. 
It may be the case that the government needs a bulletproof vehicle because the government is a government. Um, you know, but which vehicle is now the time to buy it? What were we using before? These are the kinds of yeah. questions to be That's addressed. That's the for the chief of staff. Well, it says, of, it says for use in the pool of the office. What, the, what the government has said is that it's a vehicle that is being purchased for visiting dignitaries. They said that through their commissioner, yeah. Yeah. which raises a set of other questions. Of course. Um, so, so there's that. And, and of course, there's a, an economic backdrop against which these questions are being asked, right, when you think about the economic realities. But I think in that particular instance, what is most concerning is the almost flippant response that the PPA gave. Because they just gave a one-line item to say this is in tandem with the economic realities of the time, uh, which I think is a bit um, insensitive, to say mm -hmm. the least. The other thing is that there were 40 or 30 vehicles which were purchased by the Office of the Chief of Staff, 30 vehicles, 30 buses, at a combined cost of about $2 billion. And the question that we ask is, why is the Office of Chief of Staff buying 30 buses? Uh, you don't need 30 buses in the Office of the Chief of Staff. Uh, and the response was that those buses are being purchased for use by the MDAs, the ministries, departments, and agencies, which to us is not tenable because, I mean, the MDAs should purchase their buses. They have their budgets. Exactly. There's no reason why it's outside the scope of the of the office of the chief of staff to be buying vehicles for all the MDAs. But the chief of staff can also be buying chickens. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, is uh, is buying and distributing chickens. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So so of course we raise the question as to as to why, you know, the office of the chief of staff should be engaged in buying and distributing chickens. Um, to which I think the response was equally interesting. Um, the response was that this is part of the social or sociopolitical functions of government to cater for its citizens. Um, so, so, I mean, it's, it's a bit ludicrous, but everything that a government does is to cater for its citizens. So it's not by buying chickens from the office of the chief of staff that you cater for your for your citizens. And, and by the way, I, I don't know if about you, but I didn't get my own chicken. Yeah, yes, <laughs> <laughs> so another big revelation you made in your latest response is um, the, I mean, like you already alluded to it earlier, anyway, the open letter, the 200 million naira that was paid to about four legal firms, you know, yeah. of the president, uh, on behalf of the, of the governor, yeah. yeah. What, what did you make of that? To, to, to so, the funding uh, the governor's, uh, so I think those, those awards are clearly irregular. Um, they actually fell outside the period that we looked at, and, but in the conversation that arose based on uh, the initial letter that we wrote, this now came up. Mm. And in our second letter, we indicated um, so to the governor and said that um, <clears throat> actually, um, because these awards relate to uh, personal legal representation of him as a person, it, it had to do with the nomination process. And it's a partisan political matter that uh, it's irregular and um, and needs to be to be to be looked into. Yeah. And of course, the sponsor of that award is the Ministry of Justice, who should normally be the police man in terms of you know if people are doing things wrong. So we've said that, given the involvement of the Ministry of Justice, given the fact that it's irregular, that, that actually an independent. Um, person or body needs to examine this and report to the public, you know, similar to how you might have a special investigator in a matter where the attorney general might be conflicted. Mm. And, um, and that's what we've suggested. That's what we've suggested to government. And it's important that they do that because, um, you know, clearly uh, the resources and funds of government, which is my money and your money, um, should not be used for Partisan political matters. 100%. The last um, gubernatorial election for Lagos, you yeah. were fourth. Yes. Um, so, what are your plans for the next election? What did you, if you're going to run again, um, what lessons have you learned from uh, last year's elections that would you you stand in good stead in the ahead of the upcoming elections? I think that we all learned many lessons from the last electoral process. Um, one of them is not really to assume that uh, 
we always knew this anyway, but I think it was made clearer that we should not assume that what is on paper will, will um, be in practice, let's put it that way, because we all got very excited by the uh, notion of electronic transmission and so on. Yeah. But I think more importantly, uh, and there are a lot of dynamics that played out in the last election that resulted in the outcome in Lagos, as I'm sure you know, yeah. uh, and we can go into them yeah. in detail. Um, but ultimately, um, I think that um, one of the things that we need to move towards is a situation where um, you know, we have a more, I would say, a more united opposition. Um, so that the people have concrete choices and can make informed choices between um, compelling alternatives. And alternatives that are compelling from the perspective of the candidate that they are presented with and the platform on which the candidate is running. Because we've had instances where people may love the candidate, but may, may not feel that the platform the candidate is on can mm. deliver victory. Mm. And people like to be on the winning side. You know, it's like football. <laughs> so, so there's an element of that. So, so as we think about um, the next phase, um, I think it's important to, um, uh, and this is why in political systems, that operate the kind of system that we run, which is what they call a first-past-the-post system, as opposed to a proportional representation system. What you find is that those tend to drift towards almost like two-party systems over time, because you, you need large, two large people in opposition to one another. And that will allow you to offset the weight of many things including the weight of under, underhanded behavior, mm -hmm. which we tend to see in our political yeah. process. Yeah. So I, I, I won't say more than that, but, but I think that um, 2027 will be a much more uh, interesting race. Uh, and I think um, the people themselves will be a lot more engaged, not just in a general sense of being engaged, almost as, as bystanders or as spectators. Mm -hmm. But now, as people who feel they have a stake in bringing about what they feel is needed, mm. and part of what we are doing here is to really show people that, look, this thing is not academic, right? It may look like when we are doing elections, there's party atmosphere, it's like jamboree, it's like almost like, you know, football match, premiership kind of thing. Yeah. But governance is serious business. And, and what we are doing here, part of what we are doing here is showing, actually, that, you know, these are some of the consequences of decisions. People act in particular ways that reflect who they are and what, they, what, 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 um, what their beliefs are. Their beliefs are. Yeah. And, you, you know, as a part of the process, yeah. you should know that, um, you know, you have a crucial part to play in determining who's going to make those decisions on your behalf. What are the chances that you would come out in 2027 under the same party that you did last year, ADC? I know, I know these are early days, but... The future cannot be told. Yeah. Uh, I remain a card-carrying mm -hmm. member of the ADC, as mm -hmm. we speak. Um, um, I think the political terrain is, is itself evolving. I think that evolution is happening nationally and will also happen at the state level. And, um, and so, you know, I think different things are possible. Uh, and I think we should just stay tuned. Um, but I, I think I only see good things in store, actually, for, for the people of Lagos come 2027. And I, I just want people to remain positive uh, and to stay the course. Great. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure to be good. here. Thank you. That's where we draw the curtains on today's episode. Don't forget to follow us across our social media platforms at Business Day. I remain your host, Olola Akim Akimurele. See you next time.